it lasts in one of these books. <laughs> we should have never got to these books. Can you, maybe you could um, hold this one up and show this one. And this is the fourth volume yeah. of Science and Philosophy in the Buddhist, Buddhist Classics. So these are four volumes in a series very dear to His Holiness the Dalai Lama's heart. His Holiness the Dalai Lama had often, you know, has been often talking about the wisdom of the Nalanda tradition and how the Tibetan tradition is a custodian of that great Nalanda wisdom. And one of the things that he has done, which is very innovative, is that His Holiness has argued that when you look at the great Buddhist texts, you know, even though they were written by Buddhist monks, most, most of them, for a monastic, you know, for an, a Buddhist audience, but he says that in principle, we should be able to distinguish between three categories of subject matter. One is what he would call science, kind of, you know, in a, in a broader sense, which is an attempt to describe the nature of reality. What, is, what are out there? You know, how things connect with each other. You know, how does the causal principle underpins, you know, how did the cosmos come into being? How did sentient creatures come on this, you know, mm. earth? You know, how does, uh, so all of this is a Buddhist attempt to present a scientific understanding of natural reality, of both matter and mind. Then the second category of the subject matter is philosophy and its attempt to articulate the deeper truth. You know, philosophy is at the conceptual level trying to get a big picture of why we are here, what is the meaning of existence, you know, what is the nature of truth, you know, can human beings attain enlightenment, can the mind be perfected? There's a deeper question. And what is the nature of mind? What is the relationship between cognition and emotion? So there are all these questions. These are kind of philosophical, and can human mind ever access the ultimate truth? Is ultimate truth completely beyond, you know, our accessibility? All of these are deeper questions. And how, you know, is the, is the reality that we observe in a day-to-day -day basis of this matter, is that real, or is it a construct that we create and underlying that is a truer reality, which is what a lot of Indian traditions would argue, or are ultimately everything empty, like the, as the Madhyamagas would argue. So these are deeper philosophical questions, and his holiness argues that there are no religious in their nature. There are attempts to articulate the quest and in inquiry by which you, you know, go through the quest, and some of the answers you find through this quest. That's a whole domain of philosophy. And these first two categories of subject matter, he says, should be universal should be shared, should be out there in the world, you know, alongside multiple perspectives about reality that is out there. And so this is in the third category is, of course, the really Buddhist religious aspect. And he says, that's for the Buddhist. <laughs> okay? <laughs> but the first two are really should be shared. There's no reason why they should be hidden away in this <laughs> difficult text, which non-Buddhists don't read. And the attempt here is to distill those first two aspects. And he uh, brought together a group of scholars in Dharamsala. Initially, um, outline was created, questions were created, and it was sent out to the monastic members whose job was to divide it up. All the canon, 300 and something volumes, particularly 220 something Hingo, the treatises of great Indian masters, and basically look through this and just make a compilation of all the relevant passages from these texts. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the group of editors in Dharamsala, under my supervision, so I was the chief editor, mm -hmm. and then looked at all that collated material and then put them together in a coherent way with an essay. So it's a, it's a really, and then, this is the translation and wisdom did all four of them in a beautiful way because the first two volumes are on science. One, the first one is on material science, matter. Second one is on mind science. And the idea of science from Buddhism in a, is, is a new idea because generally when people think of science, people think of Western science. 
And His Holiness is making the case that science as an inquiry method is actually quite universal. And whether we may call science in the present way or not, at least many of the things that the great masters like, you know, Vasubandhu and Asanga, they were doing was scientific. There's a scientific element. So for the first two volumes, because it's a novel way, completely revolutionary way of presenting the Buddhist material to help the reader, you know, the poor reader, you know, <laughs> uh, we um, had essays. So for the volume on matter, I wrote the essays, there are six parts, and each section begins with an essay that guides the reader, that, you know, taken through the terrain this particular section covers and making connection to the more familiar side. So they're using the familiar to introduce the unfamiliar and demonstrating that what's happening here is truly kind of in a spirit of scientific inquiry. And for the second volume, which is a science, you know, the science of mind, uh, my colleague John Dunn did the essays. Uh, each of the six sessions have an essay. And again, John Dunn made the connection with the contemporary psycholo psychological sciences and especially the contemporary clinical research and connecting them with Abhidharma mental taxonomy and Dharma kids and epistemology and you know, with the cognitive science and so on. So the first two volumes have, uh, you know, special essays. Uh, uh, from from us. Then the next two volumes are on philosophy. The third volume is actually an encyclopedia of Indian philosophy, so both Buddhist and non-Buddhist. So then the most important schools of Indian tradition, Samkhya, Nyayaeka, Mimamsa, Vaishashika, um, you know, Vedanta, Jayana. Um, so they are all done uh, comprehensively with the Buddhist um, as the last school in there. So it's a survey of Indian mm -hmm. philosophy. In, in Tibet, there were a genre of text called philosophical mm -hmm. tenets or dhrupta, that kind of a, a, a kind of a doxography type, a doxographical material. So this is an attempt to do it. Because the difference is in the traditional Buddhist encyclopedia of Indian philosophy, because it's done by Buddhists with certain agenda, they will present the non-Buddhist views, but then they will smash them down. <laughs> <laughs> so in this particular volume, because we are doing it in the spirit of pluralism, so we present faithfully the standpoints of all the schools without offering the Buddhist critiques. From their own texts. Uh, yeah. From the, you know, so basically the presentations are really kind of uh, from their own point of view, from their own text. Mm -hmm. And then the final volume, it's this one. And uh, this one, is a, is is a you know basically it's a, it's a thematic, so we chose uh, the nature of reality formulated in terms of two truths. Um, there is the uh, nature of self as another topic, and then there is um, uh, ultimate reality according to Yogacara, the whole kind of Chitta Mantra mind only with Yogacara and uh, Vasubandhu and Asanka as the key and Dharma Kirti, and then a chapter on ultimate reality according to Madhyamaka, which is the whole philosophy of emptiness. Then there is one chapter on Buddhist epistemology, Dignaga and Dharmakirti are the main kind of, you know, this theory of knowledge, theory of perception, concept formation, and all of this. So many of the topics in con co contemporary cognitive science are covered mm -hmm. there. And then the final chapter is philosophy of language. Mm -hmm. And from the Buddhist point of view, is the upper theory, differentiation theory of meaning. Um, so it's a very comprehensive um, volume. So the, the next the two volumes on philosophy, uh, other than a very lengthy introductory essay from the translators, we don't need to have a separate section kind of you know, essay. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm deeply privileged to be part of this, uh, both for the English editor for the English series, as well as you know, editor for the Tibetan series, which actually involved quite a lot of yeah. my time. Yeah. I may have spent, I actually, at one point, I clocked the time, yeah. and over a period of four years, I had spent nine months full-time on the Tibetan. Just on the, on the, wow. Yeah. yeah. So, but it was a real service to His Holiness, and it, you know, this is very dear to His Holiness. He's the one who conceived it. He's the one who structured it. He's the one who proposed the content, and um, the, the, the outline of the final settled version of the Tibetan work 
completely read out to him. We all made some changes and suggestions, but um, basically he told the editors, make sure Chimpa's happy. <laughs> <laughs> and you worked you work really hard on this yeah, series. Yeah. It's an incredible series. Actually, Jimpa and I went to, earlier in the year, went to Bod Gaia and presented His Holiness with this volume yeah. and, and let His Holiness know that we had fi finished the job. Yeah, yeah, yes. And uh, His Holiness was incredibly happy. He was. We had a little interview with him and that we'll, we'll put that out um, yeah. soon. Yeah. And His Holiness was bring home the power of reasoning. That yeah. was his message. That was his crit critical thinking. Mm, critical that was thinking. his most important message. He said critical thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And then Nalanda Tudushan's greatness lies in the reasoning, the critical thinking.